Hey, everybody tuning in. Thank you. My name is Matthew Calhoun. I'm one of the worship leaders here at the Wilmington Church of the Nazarene. I just want to say thank you for joining us today to hear Pastor Bill Luttrell's message titled, Making Christ Like Disciples. We hope that you are encouraged by this message and you will continue to join us in future weeks as God is doing a new thing in this church through the ministry of our new website and podcasts. You can find us online at www.wcotnaz.org. Thanks again and have a blessed day. We started a new sermon series um, taking us up through Easter. And um, we are preaching to you out of the book of Mark about ministering like Jesus. And for three years, from the age of 30 until the age of 33, Jesus had um, three years of public ministry. I want you to think about three years of public ministry and what Jesus did in those three years that changed the course of all history. Not only history, but it changed everything that was going to transpire down in the future to this very present day. Three years of ministry turned the world upside down. And Jesus, through his ministry, invested his life in 12 men. 12 men that didn't know who Jesus was. 12 men that had all kinds of different backgrounds. Some were fishermen, some were tax collectors. And some of these men didn't know whether they even believed that Jesus was truly the Son of God or not. But Jesus handpicked, selected 12 men, 12 ordinary, everyday men that just had regular, ordinary jobs. All of them had different gifts and abilities and talents. And Jesus chose each and every one of them with these words, come, follow me. Come, follow me. Jesus had told his disciples. He had given them the great commission after he died and rose again. He told his disciples to go into the world and to preach the gospel. The beginning of Jesus' ministry was just that. He was preaching the good news about God and he would say repent for the kingdom of God is at hand Jesus did not say uh, the kingdom of God is coming you and I today are telling everyone that Jesus is coming he is returning he is coming back but Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand all the prophets and everyone before Jesus kept saying, the Messiah is coming. The Christ, the promised one, he is coming. But Jesus' ministry was different. Just before he started his public ministry, there was John the Baptist saying, there is one coming after me whose shoes I'm not even worthy to Stoop down and unbuckle. And the one who comes after me is going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Ghost. But when Jesus starts preaching, the message changes. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Because Jesus was here. God's kingdom had come down. God's kingdom was right here, right now. And I want you to know today that His kingdom is still right here, right now, because He indwells every believer through His Holy Spirit. 
So when His Holy Spirit came to dwell inside of us that are called His church, that means the kingdom of God is right here, right now. It's not that the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is right here, right now. So while our message is that Jesus is coming back, our message is also repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. His kingdom is here, right now. In Mark chapter 1, and if you would turn there with me. In verse 14, we see where Jesus begins to call his very first disciples. After John was put in prison, verse 14, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. We're talking about ministering like Jesus. Jesus, for three years, had this public ministry, but he didn't do it alone. You and I have been called to fulfill the Great Commission, but we do not do it alone. We do it with the Holy Spirit dwelling inside our hearts and our lives, and we also share the good news of Jesus Christ with each other. Not to each other, we are working side by side with each other, reaching other people with the gospel. And just as these fishermen were fishing, there are different skills that need to take place. Let me... Let me illustrate. There was... Uh, a couple of different ways that the fishermen of that day fished. Uh, the commercial fishermen um, had large nets and they would cast those nets out and they would bring just masses of fish into their boat. But we also know that these fishermen, Jesus had instructed them from time to time to just cast out one line. In fact, there was the one time that Jesus and his disciples needed to pay their taxes. They cast one line, caught one fish, and inside the mouth of that fish was the money they needed to pay their taxes. So there's different methods of fishing. You and I together cast a net to bring the masses to Jesus. That net is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news that He came and He came and He died on a cross that every man, woman, and child would be able to have forgiveness of their sins, be cleansed from their sin, and be set free from sin for all of eternity. That's the net. We cast it together. There were times when the fishermen, their nets were so full because Jesus filled their nets. Remember that time, that story in the Bible where they had been fishing and they had fished all night long and hadn't caught any fish. And Jesus 
yells out from the seashore, Have you caught any fish? Yes, I have. You have? Well, good for you. No, we haven't caught any fish. Jesus said, Did you try the other side of the boat? Oh, we've tried the other side. We've, we've fished all night. We've tried everything. Jesus said, Try the other side of the boat. And it says that they cast their nets on the other side of the boat and their nets became so full that they were breaking. And I hear these words today and I want to ask you, have you caught any fish? Have you cast the net of the gospel out? When was the last time that you caught some soul for Jesus Christ? You know, there is an old southern gospel song that says, You catch him, he'll clean him. You catch him, he'll clean him. Together we cast the gospel out. And together we bring in souls. Sometimes it will be so many that we can hardly manage it. But that's why we all fish together. It's not just one person winning one person for Jesus Christ. We all work together. Sometimes it takes more than one person to nurture another person in the faith. They come to know Christ and you share Jesus with them. I know Roger and myself, uh, when Ron gave his life to Christ, um, both of us came to your house and we spent time in Bible study with Ron. Ron is here every Sunday loving Jesus because we caught him, God cleaned him, and he helped us to nurture him in the faith. You and I have this wonderful opportunity to reach souls by being Jesus' disciples. You may have other skills. You're not a fisherman. Maybe you don't know how to fish. Maybe you don't know anything about fishing. I think Jesus, if he had come upon some carpenters, he would have probably said, Come, follow me. And I will make you a kingdom builder. Don't you think you'd say something like that? Come and I will make you a kingdom builder. Yay. Or he would come to an accountant, maybe a group of accountants, and say, Come, follow me, and I will make you an accountability partner. Can't you see Jesus doing something like that? No matter what your skill, no matter what your ability, Jesus wants to use you just as you are. For you have skills that will build his kingdom and win lost souls, and you'll be able to do things that this pastor cannot do. And I will be able to do things that you cannot do. But all together, us working together as a team, we will reach more souls. And Jesus knew that he could not do it all by himself. And he knew that the future was the fact that he was going to die. He was going to return back to heaven. But the gospel still needed to be preached from generation to generation to generation. And that's why he chose 12 men. He sent those 12 men out. And those 12 men were given authority to preach the gospel to cast out demons. And so they went. Later on, we see that Jesus sends the disciples out again. This time it's not 12. This time it is 72 disciples, the scripture tells us. 
twelve disciples were then called and turned into apostles. But 72 disciples went out to preach the gospel. 72. I wonder where that 72 came from. I believe the 72 came from the 12 that went out. And they began to grow. And there's more followers coming. From 72, there were more followers. Now we see it's not just men, it's women. And they're from all different kinds of backgrounds. One of them we know is Mary Magdalene. And we know that she had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus. Isn't that amazing? And more and more people began to follow Jesus. After Jesus dies on the cross and he is resurrected, before he ascends into heaven, he tells his disciples, I want you to go back to Jerusalem, go back to the upper room where we had our last supper together. And I want you to stay there until you are filled with the promise that God has promised you. Now, the disciples go back to Jerusalem. Not 12, and not 72. 120 are gathered together in an upper room. They are waiting for this promise. The promise was the Holy Spirit. They were quite sure what they were expecting. They just knew that Jesus told them to go there and stay. Stay there until they received the promise. So they stayed and they prayed. And they stayed and they prayed. It says that they all came together in unity and they had all things common. And the Holy Spirit came upon them and filled them. And when they filled them, they began to speak with other languages. And people that were there on the day of Pentecost from all different countries were able to hear the gospel message in their own language because the Holy Spirit had come upon 120 in the upper room that day. Now 120, it says reached 3,000 souls that were added to the church in just one day. Multiplication. They began to multiply. I think Jesus would take a group of mathematicians and say, come, follow me, and I will make you multipliers. And Jesus starts with a simple little call. Come, follow me, and I will make you, and you can fill in the blanks. Fishermen, kingdom builders, accountability partners. What does God want to do? Jesus called them just as they were. And I want you to remember this. As we are going to minister like Jesus, we bring people in just as they are. Some of these disciples, they didn't even believe that he was the Christ yet. In fact, among these 12 that he had given authority to cast out demons, one of them betrayed him. Not only did he betray him, but he took his own life and passed into eternity without a personal, close relationship to Jesus Christ. 
but he still called him. Peter denied him. Peter kind of went back and forth. Sometimes he would make great statements of faith. And sometimes he would shrink back. When he thought his life was in danger, he would shrink back. But when he was in the presence of Jesus, he'd make great statements of faith. But Jesus said, upon this man, who is kind of wavering back and forth, upon this name, I call you Peter, I call you a rock, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church upon a person, just a plain, ordinary person, who Jesus filled with His Holy Spirit, just a plain man who was full of all kinds of weaknesses. He took that man and He built His church. Just plain, ordinary people. So when do disciples get made? Do we start making disciples after they come to faith and know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? Is that when we start as Christians to make disciples? No. When we start making disciples is from the moment that we make a contact with an individual. It's when you take them out to the ball game or you take them fishing with you or you work on their car with them and they begin to listen to you and they begin to follow you and you begin to share the gospel with them. They may not completely understand it yet. They still may have habits. They may have sinful habits. But I want you to know that if they give their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ under your ministry, the Lord will take care of the rest. All you got to do is say, come, follow me. Follow me to church. Follow me to Sunday school. Follow me to the ball field. Follow me. And let them follow you. Tell them about Jesus. And let Jesus do the cleaning. You know, so, so many times church people want to clean people up. Amen? Amen. Sometimes church people want to turn people that don't know anything about Jesus yet into one of us. To look like us, to act like us, to know all the things about the church, just like, and we expect it to happen just like that. If we're going to reach lost souls for Jesus Christ, we need to accept them just as they are because Jesus accepts all of us just the way we are. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Amen. If we're going to minister like Jesus, then we need to accept people just the way they are. They may not look just the way we think they ought to look. They may not act just the way we think they ought to act. Do you know how many times Jesus was frustrated with his disciples. He even said to Peter one time, get behind me, Satan. He was frustrated with him. These guys didn't act the way Jesus acted, but once they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit turned them more and more and more like Jesus. You've been hearing me say lately, less of me, more of you. Less of me, more of Jesus. Less of me, more of God. I want more of Him. And it only comes through Him. Nothing I do. I'm just a man like Peter. I'm not a perfect man. I have weaknesses. I have problems. I mess up. Boy, do I mess up. But somewhere along the line, Jesus said, I'm going to take you just as you are. 
two weeks ago you heard me tell how I used to stutter and I couldn't talk and I was all backwards and I was born with a collapsed head. I don't have any baby pictures of myself because of all of that. And yet Jesus accepted me just the way I was. And He helped my mother mold and shape my head. He then helped me with my disability when I had problems thinking and problems with math problems and all of those types of things and couldn't get numbers straight and I couldn't talk right. And Jesus took care of all of that. He didn't, it didn't matter to him all of my flaws. He was going to take care of my flaws. And down through the years, I have had different issues, physical issues and medical issues and problems. But I want you to know that Jesus specializes in healing me of my issues. He likes to make us just the way he wants us. It's my prayer today that each of us as his disciples would let Christ mold us and shape us just the way he wants us because he said these words to all of us one time and we heard them. He said, follow me. Do you remember that? I remember when he said, follow me. I felt this tugging in my heart. I didn't hear an audible voice say, come follow me. I felt this drawing to him. I was seven years old. I felt this drawing to Jesus. And I've been following him ever since. Not perfect in any way. I have faltered. I have stumbled from time to time. I have messed up big time, and especially in those teen years. I would never want to go back and relive my years as a teenager. They were rough on me, and they were rough on my parents. But Jesus never gave up on me. He kept molding me. He kept shaping me. He had work for me to do. And he still does. And I still have those moments, Matthew, that I want to do my own thing. I want to do things my own way. I want to see things happen a whole lot faster than they happen. <laughs> and lately, Jesus has kept saying to me, you know, you need to lose more of yourself. So I can fill you with more of me. And that takes surrender. That means when he says, follow me, I leave everything. I don't go back and pick up the nets. I follow him. But as a human being, I have a tendency to want to go right back to where I was. And some of you are nodding your heads and I know you understand what I'm saying. And all Jesus wants to do is lead. And so he says, follow me. In closing, do you remember as a child playing that little game called follow the leader? I remember in school we played this game follow the leader and one child was chosen to be the leader and the rest of us all followed behind them and whatever they would do, we would do. They raised their hand 
While they were walking, we raised our right hand. If they raised their left hand, we raised our left hand. If they walked like this, we walked like this. We walked the way the leader walked. If the leader began to say, Howdy! Howdy! We were all going, Howdy! Howdy! Whatever he would say, we would say. Whatever the leader would say, we were saying it. We were doing exactly the way the leader was. We were followers. The leader would start out and say, Come, follow me. And we would follow. I remember in school, there were some kids that got bored. So they dropped out and they sat down and the teacher said, No, you must follow. I want you to know along this journey as we're following Jesus, it is our responsibility as His followers to encourage those who sit down, those who drop out, those who who fall by the wayside and we take our hand and we reach it out and we grab them by the hand and say, come, follow with me. So you don't put them behind you. You don't put them in front of you. You step aside in the line. You take them by the hand. You walk hand in hand following Jesus together. You see, some have feeble knees and weak hands. They need to be strengthened. And that's why we work together. That's why we disciple together. We make disciples together not everyone's going to act the same not everyone's going to be the same but everyone can follow just the same it's the following that matters and I'll tell you if we follow together then we continue to look and act and be more like Jesus now once do we turn to our neighbor and say, oh, you're never going to make it. You're not doing what Jesus wants you to do. We need more Christians to stop criticizing and just do this. Amen. Amen. If we're going to win Wilmington for Jesus Christ, we need to be doing a lot of this. Meeting people, greeting people, coming alongside people. There's people hurting. They need your help. Hear these words today. Jesus said, Come, follow me. I know many of you today have done just that. You have come and you are following Jesus. But the words of Jesus are the words that you and I are to share and to speak. And you and I can say, come, follow me. And the reason why we can say that is because we're following him. Reach out and lead them. Don't wait for them to come into our church. Don't wait for them to come and kneel at an altar of prayer. 
lead them. Lead them in prayer. Lead them to the gospel. You don't have to stand in front of them like I am and preach. Just talk to them. Let the gospel flow through your conversation. Let it just be natural. And don't let it be condemning or judgmental. Jesus told the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Come, follow Jesus. Be like Jesus. Lead like Jesus. Could you stand, please?